This is a continuation of the lecture that was on Friday last week, and we're in the set of slides that's labeled CHO4 underline 5 symmetry. And you remember that when we broke off, we were looking at how to uh, determine what the point group of some molecules was, and I was talking about this flow chart as the way that we approach that problem. So you'll want to print out the uh, slides that go with this so that you can leaf through as I go through here, or perhaps have them on some separate electronic device. All right, let's go look at this flow chart for a moment and review what we were talking about. For any given molecule, we want to assign its point group symmetry, and this is very important uh, to do. So be sure that you do this week's homework and check your answers against the posted ones. And if you have any questions, please ask me about any that you couldn't figure out uh, when we meet, hopefully again on Wednesday. So to begin the process, the first thing you do is eliminate some very obvious high symmetry cases. C infinity V is a linear molecule that has a left and a right side that are different. That is to say, it's not centrosymmetric. D infinity H, on the other hand, has symmetry on both sides around its center. It has a center of symmetry, an inversion center, D infinity H. T sub D is the perfect tetrahedron, and we mean a perfect tetrahedron where all four things attached to the central atom are identical. And O sub H is an octahedron. I sub H is the uh, icosahedron, and the best example these days that we can point to is the buckyball. If it's not one of these obvious cases, then we want to see if it has rotational symmetry. So we look for axes of rotation, and we try to zoom in on the axis of rotation that is of highest order, if it exists. That's what we mean by the principal axis. So n is the order of the principal axis something like C2, C3, C4, C5, and so forth. Okay, if we do not find a principal axis, we're dealing with one of these rather trivial groups over here, uh, C sub S, C I, or C1. The next thing to look for is a horizontal mirror plane. If the molecule happens to be planar, it has that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be planar. But if we do find that mirror plane, the symmetry is C sub S. This is a group of order two. It consists only of the identity element and C sub S, or sig sigma H. If we don't find a horizontal mirror plane, we look for an inversion center. If it has that, it's C I. This is also a two-fold uh, order. It's E and I for the group. If you don't find that, you're dealing with an asymmetric molecule, one that has virtually no other symmetry other than identity, and that's C1. But if we do find a principal axis of rotation, then we have to decide whether or not we're dealing with a group that is within the C block or within the D groups. The distinguishing feature of C versus D, or D versus C, is the presence or absence of n c2 axes perpendicular to the principal axis cn. These c2 axes are called dihedral axes of rotation. And we get n of them because once we find one, the operation of cn generates a set of n of them. Okay, so let's suppose that we do not find those c2s. Then we're over here on this left branch. Notice that the next thing we do is look for a horizontal mirror plane. That's the same thing that we need to do if we're over here. So the order of looking for horizontal versus vertical mirror planes is always look for the horizontal plane first, then look for any vertical mirror planes. A horizontal mirror plane lies perpendicular to the principal axis. So if we are over here in the C branch, because we didn't find those dihedral angles, or dihedral axes, rather, we're looking for the sigma H, and we get CNH if we find it. If we don't, we're looking then for N 
vertical mirror planes. These are mirror planes that will all intersect along the principal axis. And there are n of them for the same reason that we would get n C2s. We end up with one being generated into the others of the uh, value of n from the CN axis. Okay, so if we find it, it's CNV. This is a very common point group. Water is C2V, ammonia is C3V, and so forth. If we don't find that, then we have to look for an even order S axis, a rotation uh, reflection axis. Now this is not common, so it's unlikely that you're going to find that. If you do, it is an S2N group, and this would be something like S4, S6, or S8. These molecules tend to have a rather peculiar look to them, and that's why uh, we don't find them very often. So failing to find that leaves us with CN group. Uh, this is a ro totally rotational group. Coming back over here, if we have those dihedral axes of rotation, then we're over here on the D branch, and once again, the next thing we want to do is look for the horizontal mirror plane the one that's perpendicular to the CN axis. If we find it, it's DNH. If we don't, then we look for those N intersecting vertical mirror planes. Now simply by convention, over here in the D branch, these vertical mirror planes are called sigma Ds versus sigma Vs. Don't worry about that. It's not really important. If we find the N sigma Ds, then we're dealing with DND. If we don't, we're dealing with DN, a totally rotational group. All right, now we were looking at how to apply that to some molecules, and I just want to go through some of them again. Um, the first example is over here, NH4. This is the ammonium ion, which is isostructural with methane, meaning that it's a perfect tetrahedron. So there it is. And again, this is one of those so-called special groups, so we don't need to waste a lot of time trying to figure that out. It is a tetrahedron. Now suppose that we have a substitution from one of the hydrogens becoming, say, a fluorine or any other different molecule. It would look like this. All right, now you can clearly see, I think, that there is a C3 axis along, in this case, the carbon-fluorine bond. Right there, and there again. So there's our C3. Now, we certainly are not dealing with a D group, because if I had a two-fold axis anywhere along here, perpendicular to the bond, it would flip the black ones over to this side, and the right ones over to that side, the red one over to the uh, left side, and so that certainly would be very different in its orientation, and it's not a C2. Okay, so likewise, we don't have a horizontal mirror plane. So this is a C and possibly 3 or 3V. Three well, let's see. There's a mirror plane here, there's one here, and there's one here. So we have the necessary three mirror planes to make this C3V. Okay, if we were now to add another fluorine to this thing, like this, we've certainly destroyed the threefold axis. Okay, but we still have two-fold axes if we look down the dihedra of the bonds. There's one like that. Okay. Now, we don't, again, have two two-fold axes perpendicular because the black ones which are up at the moment and the red ones which are down at the moment would flip positions, and so that would be a very different orientation. So that isn't going to work. So we know we're dealing with a C2 something or other. And the next question is, is it C2H, C2V, or C2? 
We look for a horizontal mirror plane, and of course for the same reason that we didn't find the C2 axes, the flipping of the red ones up and the black ones down, we don't have a sigma H plane. All right, so the odds are it's C2V or C2 at this point, and we do have a horizontal mirror plane here and one here. So we have the necessary two sigma V planes. That makes this C2V. Now if we add a different atom to this, such as, say, chlorine instead of a fluorine, leaving the two hydrogens in place, we'll have something that looks like this. Okay, and that's a purple straw there. Okay, now notice that this has destroyed the C2 axis that we used to have. It's no longer there. Okay, but I think we've got a mirror plane. If you look from the purple straw here through the center, which would be our carbon, and over here along the carbon-fluorine bond, that defines a plane that relates the two hydrogens to each other. All of the atoms that fall in the plane are related to themselves. That is to say, they're reflected into themselves. So this has a mirror plane, and that gets us down to C sub s, that very small order two group. Now if we look at SF4, which is the seesaw shape, you can see that there is a two-fold axis running up and down the page here that flips these two fluorines into each other, and these two fluorines, one that comes out of the page and one that goes in the page, into themselves. So we have a C2 axis. We clearly do not have a horizontal mirror plane perpendicular to that, nor do we have two-fold axes. So we can quickly see that we are dealing with a C2 group, but not a C2H. But again, it's going to be C2V because the fluorine sulfur fluorine is a mirror plane that interrelates these two fluorines to each other. And likewise, the plane of the page is a mirror plane that interrelates these two fluorines into each other and the other three atoms are in that plane reflected into themselves. Okay, over here for this nickel complex, which is square planar, a lot of the things that we saw initially when we started looking at rotational axes using a square plane as the illustration carry over into our determination of the point group here. Now, the fourfold axis is apparent. What about the twofold axes? Well, recall that we had two types of them. There's the one that runs through all the bonds here. That's one class. And then the other two along the dihedra. So now we have the necessary four C2 axes to say that this is a D group. So this is D4 something. Well, it's a planar molecule, so it has a horizontal mirror plane. So this is D4H. In similar fashion, this molecule over here, which is planar, has a threefold axis of rotation, and there are twofold axes that pass through each one of the nitrogens and along this carbon carbon bond here. So, nitrogen, carbon carbon bond here, nitrogen, carbon carbon bond here. So, that's D3H. And again, the twofold axes that make it a D are these here, here, and here. All right, now this one right here deserves a little more careful examination. It is a bridging ligand octahedral complex, but the symmetry of the octahedron has been destroyed in some ways by those bridging ligands, so this is not O sub H. Notice that in the projection here we have three of the bonds coming out of the page, three going in, and the bridging ligands something perhaps like ethylene diamine going from the top down to the bottom. So here's a model of that, looking at it right there. And you can see that we have three positions up and three down. So let me orient it like this. Three of them here and three of them down here. 
and here are our bridging ligands linking them down like that. Okay, now there's a threefold axis of rotation that passes right through here. And we can see that by twisting like this. There's one twist of a third, and here's another twist of a third of a total rotation. So it has a three C3 axis. Now it may not be immediately obvious, but it also has twofold axes of rotation. They pass through the bridges and the central atom like this. So let me see if I can show you that one. There it is. And you can do the same thing over here with this one, and the same thing over here with this one. So this is a D3 something or other. Okay, the possibilities are D3H, D3D, and D3. We have to look for a horizontal mirror plane next, and that clearly is not there, because it would take this position down over to here and this position over to here, and that is not equivalent. Next, we would look then for the vertical mirror planes, and they don't exist either, because they would flip the sense of the bridging ligands going from left to right as we go from top to bottom here. That leaves us with D3. All right, now, if you look at that carefully, you'll notice that it looks kind of like a propeller or a screw. I could screw this into the table by turning in a clockwise direction. I would unscrew it by going in the opposite direction. That suggests that this is a chiral molecule, and indeed it is. Here's its partner. And notice that this would screw in by going in the left-hand direction and screw out in the right-hand direction. So we have a chiral pair. Now notice that the point group here was D3. That is not asymmetric. Asymmetric is C1. So it may come as a surprise that we can have chiral molecules with some symmetry. More about that in a moment. Now there are patterns to some of these molecules that are worth knowing, and one is the often encountered relationship between DNH, DND, and DN for molecules that are constructed by regular geometrical patterns on a left and a right side, or a top and a bottom side, if you will. And certainly one of the easiest examples to look at for that would be something like ethane in its three individual conformers. So we've talked about this before. Here is the eclipsed form, and you can see the threefold axis that we're looking down here. It also has twofold axes that run right through the middle, like this. And certainly if I find that one, the C3 axis means there has to be one over here and there has to be one over here. So there is a D3 at minimum. But of course it also has a horizontal mirror plane. And the one end is reflected into the other in this eclipsed configuration. All right, now what you've got is basically a triangle of hydrogens over here and a triangle of hydrogens over here, and they're eclipsed. So you can see this as reduced down to two regular geometric figures that are in an eclipsed orientation. Here's the Newman projection of this. Whenever you have regular geometric figures like this, separated in space, that are eclipsed, you're looking at a D and H. So if these had been squares, for example, lined up with each other, it would be D4H. If it were pentagons, it would be D5H. Now, we can also look at the staggered configuration, which is here. Let me draw it a little bit better there, or make it a little bit better. Okay. So once again, we have a threefold axis of rotation. You can see that right there. And here's one thing to appreciate. By 
twisting around that carbon-carbon bond, which is the threefold axis of rotation, we do not destroy in any way the C3 axis. And that's always the case. If you rotate like that about an axis of rotation, you don't destroy it. Now here it may not be quite as obvious where the twofold axes are. They are oriented like this in the middle of the carbon-carbon bond, sort of like that and that. And here's the other one, like that. So again, it's a D3, no doubt about it. The horizontal mirror plane, of course, has been destroyed by misaligning the two triangles of hydrogen. And so that gives us then three vertical mirror planes that are sustained and D3D for the point group. Here's the Newman projection once again. Okay, so again, this is a regular pattern that is in a certain orientation. Here we have triangles that are staggered relative to one another. Whenever you have two regular geometrical figures separated in space equally along a line and they are staggered, it's going to be a D and D. So if this were a square, it would be D4D, a pentagon D5D. But here they're triangles, so it's D3D. And finally, we can have a random twist like this, and that's our skewed or gauche configuration, whichever you want to call it. Again, I have not destroyed the C3 axis. The C2 axes are, again, sort of in the same like positions that we had in the uh, staggered configuration, sort of between the up and down matched pairs of carbon-hydrogen bonds, like that and that. So yes, it is a D3. We've lost, however, not only the horizontal mirror plane, but also the three vertical mirror planes. This reduces us to D3. Once again, it's a case of regular figures that are now in a random orientation relative to one another. And whenever that situation in, in occurs, you're dealing with the DN group, D3 in this case. Here's a great example of that. It's our old friend the tennis ball. I've darkened the seam so that you can see this a little bit better. One thing to appreciate about the way a tennis ball is constructed is that it is basically two pieces. Notice that there is a flap that looks like this. See, it's wrapped around the ball. And this is the other flap over here, which is the same thing. It's just two flaps. Now notice that those two are in the staggered orientation to one another. So by what I've just said here, you might suppose that this is D2D, and you would be right. All right, let's take a look at it analytically to verify that. Well, first of all, we need to find a two-fold axis. The easiest one, I think, to see is this one right here that passes through over here. In other words, it's through the middle of one flap. There's the C2 axis right there. Okay, now, if I call that one the principal axis, then there have to be two two-fold axes perpendicular to this one. All right, so I'm going to look over here, somewhere along here. Well, it's right here. Now, notice that this looks like a backwards integral sign as I'm orienting it right now. The two-fold axis emerges right here. Let me do the rotation around it. There it is. Where's the other one? Well, the other one is over here. Notice that this looks like a properly drawn integral sign. And I can do a two-fold rotation around there. So sure enough, it is a D2 family group. OK, so I've said that it's D2D. Well, notice that it isn't D2H, because perpendicular to this C2 axis here, it's very much different right and left. That's the perpendicular plane right there. So it's not D2H, but it sure is D2D. The flaps that compose it are symmetrical. So I just bisect the thing right here and here. 
And likewise, if I go this way, it's symmetrical. I'm going through the other flap. So yeah, it is D2D. The tennis ball is a classic example of a hard one to see. But if you analyze it like this, it's very quick. And then if you look very carefully at it, yes, you can come to the same conclusion. D2D. That's kind of a fun one. All right, let's take a look then at the phenomenon of chirality. In the past, when you were doing organic chemistry, you were told that if a molecule was dissymmetric, or asymmetric rather, it was chiral. And that's only part of the story. If you're dealing with organic compounds where there are only four bonds and the tetrahedron is the highest uh, kind of geometry around a given atom, yes, the presence of asymmetric carbons is going to give rise to chirality. And the point group, incidentally, of those molecules is C1. That is the point group of all asymmetric molecules. But as we've just seen, it's possible to have a good deal of symmetry and still be chiral. We saw the D3 case of our tris-ethylenediamine cobalt complex. Well, in general, molecules that are optically active are dissymmetric. Asymmetric molecules are just simply the least symmetrical of dissymmetric molecules. Dissymmetric molecules, in general, can have no symmetry higher than proper rotations. In other words, no mirror planes, no inversions, no s-axes. Okay, so if you think about what groups would be composed of only rotations, you come to these, and you include C1, the asymmetric group. So these are the molecules that can have, or the symmetries of molecules that can have uh, chiral character and optical activity. Certainly C1, asymmetric. But CN is a totally rotational group. DN, as we saw in the case of our cobalt complex, in the case of D3, is also an example. So these are symmetries that are possible for optically active molecules. Now in principle there are a few others. T is the totally rotational subgroup of T sub D, O the same of O sub H, and I the same rotational group of I sub H, subgroup of I sub H. These in principle could be opt optically active. However, there are no molecules that I can think of that have these symmetries in reality. So uh, these aren't worth worrying about. So for the most part, real molecules that are optically active belong to one of these two families or this particular point group right here.